before heading back to Florida for one final um, stop or experience, and that was in Quincy, Florida, just, just west of Tallahassee, um, the home of, uh, of uh, one of the uh, sort of legendary uh, but unsung heroes, uh, legendary within the movement but unsung largely outside of the movement, uh, Patricia Stevens Dew, who along with her daughter, uh, Tanana Reeve Dew, uh, wrote a quite remarkable book three years ago called Freedom in the Family. Patricia Stevens Dew, who, was just re who lived most of the last 30 years in Miami, Florida, but has just returned to, to her childhood home in Quincy with her husband, John Dew, uh, who was a leading voting rights attorney um, in, in the 1960s and into the 1970s. Um, and so uh, it, it was quite remarkable that we were able to, to sit down in the living room of the Dews. Um, with the embodiment of the two themes of the course, a civil rights attorney and a movement activist uh, who had been married, you know, for more than more than forty years, uh, who who were kind of you know kind of a living, breathing um, example of the of the duality of the movement and of the duality of what we had been trying to present in the course. So uh, we were so so fortunate that they had returned to Quincy. Uh, along our route back and we spent, uh, I think it's safe to say, a quite remarkable afternoon with the dues. And I'm glad you mentioned Florida because Florida played a key role in the civil rights movement, not just for this state, but for the nation <clears throat> as a whole. Uh, we sat in at Woolworth on February 13, 1960. I mean, it, it was so chaotic. Uh, the people were so surprised. Name calling, hecklers, uh, the whole thing. We left after several hours. Then, a week later on the 20th, we went back. And this time, we didn't get to leave. There were 11 of us. Uh, we were arrested. And uh, my sister and I had decided that we would not pay for segregation. We felt that if we paid the fines, uh, but the fines didn't come up right away. We got out on bail, and we continued our demonstrations. And then our trial date had been set for March 3rd, 1960. And our school, FAMU, had 3,000 students. All students said they were not going to class that day. They were all going to converge on that segregated courtroom. I mean, it was probably a little larger than this. And when they heard this downtown, they postponed the trial. So we continued our demonstrations. And this is how I happen to be wearing these dark glasses even today. Because as more of our students got arrested and we went to see about them, first we had learned in court to negotiate. We can talk about the problem tried to resolve it without taking direct action. But no one on any level would talk to us, so we began to march downtown. As we approached the dividing line between the then colored town and white town, which was a railroad track, uh, you had police officers everywhere. They wouldn't talk to us, but they were there to attack us. And you know, um, actually, I don't think people think of it this way, but a war was declared on colors, on Negroes, on blacks, African Americans. <clears throat> because then, one police officer said, I want you, looking right at me, threw a tear gas bomb right in my eyes, and I mean, we had never been tear gas. We had never been arrested. We didn't know what was going on. Some young man, I could not see at that time. Some young man took my hand and told me to come with him. He said, I've been in the army. Don't wipe your eyes. He gave me a handkerchief. Just cover your eyes. And he led me to a church and sat me there. 
and in Tallahassee, I'm talking about Tallahassee, Florida, I'm not talking about Alabama, Mississippi, I could hear the students screaming because they too were being tear gassed. So then the trial date was set for the 17th of March. We were sentenced to 60 days in jail for sitting in at a board lunch camp. There were eight charges against us, I don't even remember what they all were. Three were dropped, five were found guilty of, I guess. And we were told we had to go to jail to pay a $300 fine. Several got out to start the appeal process. Uh, but at that time, there were five of us, and we spent the time in jail. And people all over the country knew what was going on. And we got so many letters from all across the country, from people who could not understand why we were in Jefferson and we were in lunch County. After all, this was Florida, the paradise state, but not for us. Gaston County was about 90% Negroes, as we would call them, and only a couple of hundred were registered to vote. So we looked at those numbers and wondered why, because they were intimidated because they were afraid. I have a lot of relatives here, had a lot of them then. But they were even afraid to let me live with them because I had spent that time in jail and they were afraid to be associated with me. Every time I went to visit, Ray, if I came to visit you, here in Gaston County, a police officer followed me. If I stayed 30 minutes, he stayed 30 minutes because he wanted you to know that he knew you were talking to me. And, and, and this was a form of uh, intimidation. Now later, when we got to Freedom House, 62, 63, when we needed help, when we were being shot at, not in Mississippi, not in Alabama, but right here in Gaston County, Florida, not too far from where you turn off to come into here, we were being shot at because whites and blacks were living there at the Freedom House trying to get uh, blacks to register and to vote coming out to places like this, which uh, were the tobacco plantations, and trying to get people uh, to register. Now, those times, those, those police officers who followed us didn't help us. They disappeared. But we must tell the stories so that uh, people would realize that there was and there is a problem in this state then and today. I, I, okay, I would just like to say just for the record, in the state of Florida, I was arrested near you, arrested in Tallahassee uh, several times. Uh, fighting and charged me once. He can tell you about the court case later. It was actually thrown out. Arrested in Ocala, Florida. Sentenced to two years in jail. Arrested in uh, Miami, Florida. Several times. Arrested in New York in 1964 during the World's Fair when Governor uh, Ferris Bryan was up there at the, the Florida Pavilion talking about Oh, Florida is a paradise. And we went there and said, well, it's a paradise. We could as hell for us. <laughs> and we were picketing. And we, we, were, we were arrested. I, I don't know who was climbing that orange. It sure wasn't one of our people. But once that fellow was up there on that orange, they came and arrested all of us. <laughs> so time and time again, in this state, the same things happened here. Yeah, you know, even before my, I, I, was, I was in the early 50s, Harry T. Moore, I mean, things happened that people didn't really talk about. Rosewood, things happened that people tried to forget. And I got a call, my husband told me, from somebody, a minister from some church in Tallahassee. He said, oh, I've talked to the governor. And the governor wants you to know now, or governor, I don't talk, nobody can, I don't talk through somebody to get to Jed Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor <clears throat> wants to know if he can send you some papers so he can give you a pardon 
apart and from what I serve my time. Mm -hmm. And they should be the ones apologizing to us. Now this is all becoming political now. You know, everybody wants to do this and wants to do that and uh, all I want, just give me my 40 acres and a mule <laughs> and to everybody else so that people will have, do it collectively and figure out a way to help people who um, have nots. There all those children who spend all that money to put in boot camps. Put it in education. 